the hospital. Uh, so we took their name and we removed the anti, which made it very fun because most people think that anti something is always against the thing that was started before. So everybody thinks we're the original, which is quite funny as well. Uh, Pirot Biron is uh, an organization that works for uh, the better of the internet. So we wanted to make people realize that it was really good with the internet. And we did demonstrations on the street saying, we need 100 megabits at home. Otherwise, we don't have real uh, welfare in Sweden. We're a big welfare country. And um, uh, you know, today, everybody has 100 megabit in Sweden. And we take full credit for it. And that's usually what we do. So we've been. Um, Partly a lobby organization talking to uh, political parties about why copying is good and just raising questions why copying isn't always interesting and, and such. And uh, we had all our own uh, organizations called PPP, which was the Polar Pirate Prize, where we gave out prizes to the best ISPs in, in Sweden, saying, you know, you're good because you don't hand out uh, user information to anti piracy agencies. And then we started the Pirate Pay. Thank you. I don't, I, I don't recognize the language here. I, Pau took a snapshot of the site for me. Um, but the Pirate Bay was started as a way to make Swedish people uh, use the BitTorrent technology. So we didn't, we didn't make the BitTorrent technology ourselves. We just copied it, uh, like we always do. Uh, but we also wanted a, a Swedish place for uh, Swedish file sharers to actually share all the files. And Pirate Bay was in Swedish to begin with. And uh, all the other sites that were using BitTorrent technology, which is very good decentralized technology, they got shut down. And mostly because uh, of political pressure. Uh, there was the big Hollywood organizations were really upset about uh, file sharing. So they went to different police officers and said, you have to close down the sites. They sent uh, really long letters to 16-year-olds saying, we're going to sue you for 20 million billion dollars if you don't close down your site. And usually people do. We didn't. Uh, and that was kind of the reason that Pirate Bay grew. And after maybe two years, Pirate Bay uh, was just full of people from other countries. So all of a sudden, the most downloaded torrent on Pirate Bay, which was still in Swedish, was a Swedish language course. And 60% of the torrent was actually in Spanish. And I'm going to brag a bit. So here's, I, I hope this is correctly translated. Yet again, friends of mine who, don't, who helped me. So that Pirate Bay was a tracker system in the beginning. It's not anymore because that's not needed. And tracking means that computers connect to the tracker and ask for other computers that have information they want to share. So every second, there was 100,000 computers, at least, connecting to the Pirate Bay trackers asking for other computers in the world that had information. And Looking at how big BitTorrent is, Pirate Bay was 60 to 65%, almost 70% sometimes, of all the BitTorrent traffic in the world. And then we can do a calculation of how much BitTorrent traffic is on the internet. And it's like 80% of all the internet traffic. Let's see. Yeah, so in the end, Pirate Bay became over half of all of the traffic on the internet. And the funny thing about that is that Pirate Bay has always been run as a hobby project. So uh, it happens sometimes that Frederick, who is one of the admins, he was running the servers, and he tripped over a cord because he was drunk. And the Pirate Bay just vanished from the internet. And for two days, there would be no, you know, half of the internet would just go away because he was drunk or something like that. This doesn't really work, so I'll do this instead. And another funny story, Pirate Bay, as everybody else, starts somewhere. This uh, blue box in the middle is the first Pirate Bay server. Uh, it's in a shoebox. And this is actually from Mexico City, where Pirate Bay was actually hosted the first year. So thank you. A bad thing at that time, it was 2003, was that there wasn't really enough bandwidth for us. And uh, someone at the electrical company wanted bribes. Um, so we couldn't host it in, in, uh, in Mexico anymore. So we moved it to Sweden, a country famous for polar bears. And uh, Pirate Bay started growing. And uh, we started receiving threatening letters from lawyers all over the world, mostly from Hollywood. And they were saying, like, we're going to sue your ass in the US because you're breaking the US law, this and this and this. And 
we had we made a decision like we would never shut down the site because of pressure from from lawyers because we believe that pirate bay is legal especially in sweden where we have laws about it and we sent pictures like this to the lawyers instead and we said well you have your dmca or what do you call it and copyright that's not very important to us because we have real problems we have polar bears in our streets and they try to eat us um, <laughs> that's a problem you know we can help you with that and they didn't really know how to respond to something as stupid as that. Also, sometimes we sent pictures of a world map, not just US map. We showed here is the world, here is the United States, here is a big lake, here is Sweden. We're not actually under your laws. And they didn't know again how to respond. And these are Hollywood lawyers. Thank you. And what else? We didn't just make fun of them when we responded. We published all the, the responses and their emails. Uh, so there is, on the Pirate Bay, uh, it's a legal site where you can read all of the letters we got. This is my favorite letter. It's partly because I think it's brilliant and partly because it's brilliant. Um, this is from a German company called Linotype. They're a company that sell fonts. So all of the fonts you have on your computer would probably be somewhere from Linotype. They own Helvetica, for instance, which is so big that it made a movie out about it. Um, and they sent this list of fonts that they found on the Pirate Bay that they said, we have to make sure that they're not on the site anymore, uh, available for download for anyone. And they sent um, like a contract that they wanted us to sign. It said, well, you have to pay 25,000 euros, and you have to sign here and say you never allowed these fonts to be downloaded via the Pirate Bay, and blah, blah, blah. So we decided we have to do something funny about it. So we took their letter and we just reversed everything. So we wrote like, you have to pay us 25,000 euro and you have to promise us to never do this again and blah, blah, blah. And to make it a bit more interesting, we used all of their funds that they complained about. <laughs> so really funny thing, when you do something which is this clever, I'm not taking credit for it because no one should take credit for anything. Uh, you don't get a response, but th then you kind of won anyhow. And if you want to see more, there's probably like 20, 30 more legal threats like this. And the thing that happens when you get funny about things, people give you attention. And Pirate Bay became really, really huge, both for the reason that we had attitude and because the site was growing and the technology was really good. So we became kind of a political player when it Anything that happened surrounding the internet, the, the media started calling us and asking for our advice and what we thought about it. And we became really like famous in Sweden for what we did. And there was a lot of things that we didn't like on the internet, so censorship being one. And there was a really famous uh, website in Russia that we were kind of fighting about in Europe. It was called allofmp3.com. It was a Russian website you could legally buy music. So you could buy uh, any track for 10 cents. Instead of the $1 you pay on iTunes, the same track legally for 10 cents. And, and they, were, they were really successful. So in uh, Denmark, the record company sued the ISPs for allowing access to all of MP3 in Russia. They said, well, when your clients are actually downloading the, the, the song, you have the data in your cables, so you are breaking copyright, which is just stupid. And they brought in experts, which was employees of them, of course, saying to the uh, Danish Supreme Court that, well, you know, this is actually a big crime and you have to stop it. So all of mp3.com was the first site in Denmark to get uh, suspended from the internet. Not a big problem, you would think, but we were really against the whole censorship. And uh, Sweden and Denmark are really close, and most operators in Denmark also operate in Sweden. So one of them decided that they wanted uh, to be pro-artist and pro-music. So they said, we're going to censor all of MP3 from all of our customers in Scandinavia, so even Sweden. And we were quite upset because that meant that they decided what was OK and not OK to have on the internet. So we uh, did something very radical. We started a, a site where we wanted people to change ISP. And then we made so that all of the customers from this ISP uh, they were met by a small text on the Pirate Bay when they came to the website saying, your ISP suck. They're really, really crappy. They're trying to control the internet, and you shouldn't have an ISP like that. 
So here's a telephone number you can call in and say you want to change operator. Here's the email you can send. Just press here, and you'll you know, change operators. And they called us up after maybe a day and said, well, we have a big problem. We're losing all of our customers. Because everybody was calling, they employed 10 people just to reply to all of the emails and phone calls they got. And people were quite upset. And the CEO of this company, he called me and said, I can promise we'll never censor the Pirate Bay. And I said, well, I don't care if you censor the Pirate Bay. We're blocking you. you know, we don't care about you. We'll find some way around you. And so you should remove the, the, your censorship off the internet and just be an ISP. And he said, ah, I can't do that because it would re be really bad press for us. We're really you know, trying to make a stance for ourselves. And 10 days later, they had a new CEO. So that's what happens. And having like, political influence like that became something which is not very common for geeks like us. Uh, and there was even more pressure from the US companies against us. So we just kept going and doing more uh, stupid stuff because we like doing stupid stuff. So uh, there was a discussion about you know, the US pressuring Sweden to get the Pirate Bay offline. So we said, well, this country, Sealand, which is a micronation outside of the UK that probably no one has heard about. It's actually just a platform. Uh, it's up for sale, so let's buy it. So we started a website called buysealand.com. And just like a joke, we were sitting drinking beer and eating pizza and say, let's try buy it. So we made a website and started asking people for money so we could you know, buy a country and have our own country, remove all copyright laws, and have free hosting and lots of parties and everything. And it was really, it was a big joke. And we had this idea that we've got money, we could try and do an offer on them. And uh, otherwise, we could buy a small nation somewhere or do something with the money. It wasn't really that important. We just wanted to do something fun. And uh, it kind of blew up. It became really, really huge. So in two days, we got 20,000 US dollars. And uh, we were, I think, number 200. The website was number 200 in the world in traffic. And all of a sudden, we see the prince of Sealand. They actually have a royal family of Sealand, all of the seven people living there. Um, <laughs> he was on CNN, I think on Larry King show, together with two of the lawyers from Disney and Warner Brothers, talking about the international crisis it would be if there would be a nation like that that we run. <laughs> and they were really upset. They took this really serious. And we were like, whoa, it was like a you know, we were drinking, come on. <laughs> and uh, in the end, one of the reasons I'm not drinking anymore at all is because I gave away all the money when we had a fight what we should do with it. Because it ended up, they wanted $6 billion. It's like, whew. Uh, so we couldn't buy it. So I gave away the money to rainforests, and that's not very popular with all of the other people. Other things we do, uh, we have some people that don't like us. Hollywood and the music industry being the two major uh, players. The record companies have uh, an organization called uh, IFPI. It's the International Federation of Phonographic Industry. Not pornographic, but phonographic industry. So uh, we're, we're really good at the internet. We know how the internet works. So um, one day we, I woke up and I had a new domain name that someone registered for me, uh, IFPI.com, because IFPI forgot to renew their domain name. So someone gave me the domain, and we started International Federation of Pirates Interest, IFPI. <laughs> and IFPI were really upset about this, and they sued us. Uh, and in the end, we lost the domain name because they were actually in the jury that decided over domain names. Who knew? Um, but it didn't cost us anything, so that's nice. Also, we, have, um, we did another website in Sweden. The IFP also did a like a project that they wanted to be a bit nice about the internet, say, hey, we understand the internet, and we want users to be really connecting to us. So let's make a website uh, with lists of where you can buy music legally, and the artist would get paid, and blah, 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 even though it's just bullshit. So they made a website called schystmusik.se, which means like fair music in Sweden. The word schyst in Swedish is very hard for most people to, uh, to actually spell. Uh, it's imported from Dutch which is a really hard language. And you can spell it in five different ways in Swedish. Uh, but you couldn't spell it the way they did. That's like the only way they, you, you don't spell it in Swedish. So we bought all the domain names that were actually correctly spelled in Sweden. So like for 50 US dollars, we had all of the other domain names. 
and they didn't realize. And all of a sudden, they started doing uh, radio advertising, which is quite stupid for a website, uh, saying, you should go to this site, and you should find all the music you want, and it's perfectly legal, and it's great for the artist. And everybody, of course, went to our website, and they came to the Pirate Bay Music site, and they, they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising for our website, which was great. <laughs> Costed us 50 US dollars. And they also did a campaign in Norway called Piracy Kills Music, which is quite funny because Norway has the domain name .no. So it became quite stupid to have Piracy Kills Music no. Um, <laughs> they don't realize you know, that people read this. And uh, so we watched, watched their website, and we realized they translated it to different languages because of the URL instruction. So we bought piracykillsmusic.se and fi and all of the local uh, uh, countries up north in, in, uh, in Europe. So we effectively made them not able to use the same campaign in other countries. So it kind of blew up. So they really hate us for being you know, quite annoying towards them. And uh, you know, they, they never realized who we were. So they tried getting information, like who are these people behind like, nicknames like Brook P or Nanakata and Tiamo and stupid names. Uh, and Metutu for once, a guy that liked the Lion King Club or something. So we uh, annoyed them a bit more. We collected money and we bought a bus, an old city bus, and we took like a digital community, lots of friends, and we drove the bus from Stockholm up north to uh, to, Vienna, to the north of Italy, to Bolzano, and exhibited the bus uh, as part of Pirate Bay, as the art project Pirate Bay. To in one of the world's most prestigious art festivals called Manifesta. So they were like, who are these people? Are they hippies or what's up? They're like, they're artists, uh, they're pirates, and they're just really clever and they know everything about us. So they sent private investigators after us. Thing is, I never understood why. Because first of all, everything we do is online. Um, if you have a private investigator after you, he actually has to be behind your computer to see anything. So it's quite stupid, right? But it's even more stupid, because if you look at the types of people we are, so let's take Frederick, for example. Um, at the time when we had the private investigators following us for six weeks, Frederick was working uh, at an ISP. So he went around all of Gothenburg in Sweden and installing DSL lines for customers and blah, blah, blah. And in the evening, he went out to all of the bars in, in uh, Gothenburg, and the private investigators had to follow him around all over the city. And he slept with at new places every night and was really a big mess. And they didn't find out anything interesting. So we got the records from um, uh, these private investigators afterwards. And the stack of Frederick was this big, like places he's been to in six weeks. Uh, but Gottfried, the guy who lived in Mexico before, uh, for six weeks, they saw him once because he never goes out, because he's a geek. <laughs> so there was like paper saying, two guys coming to his apartment, going in with three pizzas, two people coming out. It's like, that's it. <laughs> and I, I saw one of the private investigators once, because I was walking home from, uh, from the pizza shop nearby. What's up with this pizza talk? Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> so I was walking, I bought pizza, and I was walking home, and all of a sudden I see a flash uh, in a car, like the, it's really dark outside, and you know there's a flash just going off in a car. Not usually happening in my neighborhood, and it's a Danish car, and I'm living in Sweden, so I'm, I'm looking at the car and I'm, what's going on. So I, I walk over to the car, and the guy and he just starts driving like crazy and goes away, and is you know I'm thinking who is this guy? So I, I write down the number plates for the car because I'm, I'm smart enough to do that. And I go to the Danish car registry, and I check who owns this car. And tip, if you want to become a private investigator, if you use a car, you shouldn't use one that is registered to a company called Private Investigators. <laughs> really stupid. Uh, and, you know, in the end, a lot of things happened. Uh, I don't have pictures for it, because a lot of secrecy happened. Um, the, Hollywood became so upset, so they went to the White House and said, you need to pressure this country, Sweden, which apparently is not in the United States. What a shocker. Uh, and make them shut down this website, which some people run, and we don't know anything about them because, because they're weird. Uh, they're not like us. Um, so 
uh, they, the White House, the Justice Minister and someone else, I think the Vice President of the US, invited the Swedish Justice Minister to come over with the secretaries and everything. And they were sitting down talking and, and said, you know, you have to do something or we're going to do trade sanctions like with Cuba. We're not going to trade anything with you. We're not going to buy Volvos, we're not going to buy Saabs. And I'm thinking, you know, nobody does anyhow. Um, so it was really, the Swedish people were quite scared. So they went back to Sweden and told the police that they had to go and do something about the pirate bay. In Sweden, it's actually legal for ministers to tell the police whom to go after. You can only tell them you should focus on this and this. Uh, but the justice minister was so scared, so he did it anyhow. So all of a sudden, there's 50 police officers going to different locations because they couldn't find the pirate bay's servers at just one location. On the website, the pirate bay, there was pictures of them and GPS and map and everything, uh, but it's apparently quite hard to find information for some people. Um, but so they took 200 servers, 20 of them were Pirate Bay, and uh, they were thinking maybe, you know, if we take the servers, the problem will go away. They won't have any machines to run this site on. Uh, but we're not really in need of those machines. We can get any machines. So in three days, Pirate Bay came back to life after just three days. It would have been two days if it wasn't for that party uh, the first night. Um, <laughs> Another story, uh, but it was quite amazing because we came back uh, just at, at the same time as a demonstration in Sweden. So uh, over a thousand people, which is a lot for being Sweden, went to the government outside the building and started protesting about the raid against the Pirate Bay. They said, you're taking culture away from us. You're not allowed to. You shouldn't uh, do this. And in the media, the Swedish TV found out that uh, actually, the U.S. took credit for it. They published press releases saying, we are behind the Pirate Bay raid. And the Swedish people are like, no, 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 the U.S. has nothing to do with this. That would be illegal, um, and so on. So this, it became very apparent that young people in Sweden really like the Internet, and old people don't really get it. And this is the perfect picture for it, because this is in Swedish, and it says, give us back the server, or we're going to take your fax machine. So, you know, everything we do is always with a bit edge. And we released, of course, one press release saying something about the raid. We never talked about it. We just published a small blog post saying, you know, this, I'm going to read this actually for you, some few statistics about why the Pirate Bay sometimes is down. And as I told you before, Fredrik being drunk is the main reason for why Pirate Bay was down quite a lot. Uh, otherwise, Gottfried was actually once tripping over a cable as well, and he was so sick they couldn't go there and pick it up, and it was down for a week. But then the U.S. government and the Swedish police, they steal everything we own. It's down for three days, and it's like, oh, better luck next time. And this sparked a big debate in Sweden. Everybody was just really happy about the pirate bay, except the police and the ministers, because they couldn't handle the situation. And all of a sudden, we had a political party in Sweden that grew and grew and grew because of this. They got so much attention. The Pirate Bay was just growing, uh, increasing with traffic like 100% in just a week because of the raid. So everything that happened with the raid was just giving us more traffic. And the Pirate Party, they were like 100 members before the raid. And afterwards, they were like 50,000 members that paid to be a member in the party. And they are now the third biggest party in, in, uh, in Sweden, if you count numbers of people actually active within the party. And in Europe, we have two elections. We have the local elections, the national elections. Then we have the European Union elections. And last year in the European Union elections, the Pirate Party got 8% of the votes. That means that they went to the European Union Parliament with two parliamentarians that work full-time on just the issues of, that we are interested in, in copyright and freedom of speech and, and censorship. And they also joined the, the Green Group in the European Union, which is like 30% of uh, all of the, the people there, and said, well, we'll give you our votes in all of the green questions if you vote like us when it comes to the internet. And they agreed. So now 30% of the, uh, the politicians in the European Parliament is voting pirates, which is great. And also what happened more is that most of the record companies, after all of the debates about why file sharing is good, I'm not going to go into that because it's so obvious, um, they started their own um, organizations. So we had a really bad name, but this is 
uh, a group called the Swedish Model. I shared office space with them, and we got lots of requests for uh, you know, hot girls that wanted pictures taken and blah, blah, blah. But it's actually a model of business, so it's something different. So it's seven Swedish record companies that formed this group and said, well, we're really for file sharing. We want people to download our music because we want fans. And they had the slogan like they'd rather have 100 people buying their CDs and 100,000 people listening to them than just 100 buying and 100 listening. That's like their business model. And they went to the Swedish government and they were talking to all of the big political parties and said, we are from the organization, we're from the record side, and we want file sharing to be legal. And me and my friends, we were invited all over the world to talk, like here to Mexico. Here is me on one of the few pictures I can show of myself, but I hate myself. And Richard Stallman, that you probably know in the middle, and President Lula from Brazil, who I actually like. I don't know his situation here, but I like him. Because when I met him last year and at Fisley, and he came up to me and gave me a hug. And the first thing he said is something like, Peter, do you know that Brazil and Sweden don't have an extradition treaty? <laughs> yes, good information, you know. So I really like this part of, of the world. <laughs> and it, it's really a big thing that's happening because people from all over the world are actually siding with us, like Lula, on these questions. And I went to South Africa and talked to ministers there, and they were like, of course, this is culture. It should be an important integral part of people. But I'm going to tell you a little bit why this happened. It's nothing new. Uh, the thing that happened with the internet is just that we had new technology that gave us new possibilities. And a lot of people have called this a revolution, but it's not really a revolution. It's just normal evolution. So uh, in, in the early 19th or 20th century, there was all of the movies were black, white, and was no sound. And all of a sudden, there, there's this movie that plays sound within them uh, coming out to the cinemas. And what happened is that all of the people that were playing instruments in the cinemas in the, in the US, they started striking because they didn't want the, they wanted to ban the talkies, as they call them. They didn't want to have color movies, they didn't want to have sound movies, because they would lose their jobs. And that's just stupid, because it turned out that you know, everybody's making much more money from color films. So they wanted to stop evolution. It didn't work. And then you have like the record industry. They've always been trying to stop evolution. So first, you know, music really a long time ago, if you wanted to listen to it, you had to go and listen to people playing music in the street or some sort of concert. And you couldn't record anything. Then all of a sudden you get this the vinyl and you can listen to music at home. And artists were really upset because they realized, well, we're gonna lose our jobs. People are going to buy our CDs or our vinyls once, and they're not going to go and listen to us. They're not going to pay us money to do uh, performance. And like, we need to stop the vinyl. And they couldn't because it was illegal to stop it and blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that they never made so much money before. Vinyl was the best thing that ever happened to the music industry. Then radio comes. And the same thing all over again. Oh, people are going to listen to radio, and they're not going to buy the vinyls. We're not going to be able to sell music anymore. And we need to stop it. We need to ban the radio. And yet again, you can't ban the radio. And it turned out that, well, we are, now we make more money from radio than we ever did from selling vinyl. And then cassette players came, and you could record music from radio. And what happens? We need to ban the cassette player, because people can record the music, and they won't listen to radio. So we won't make any money anymore. And they tried banning it, and it didn't work. So turned out they made more money than ever selling cassettes. And then they tried to be a bit proactive and, and dig a digital form. Because what they didn't like with the cassette in the music industry was that you could actually record over it and you could record from the radio, so they didn't have control over it. So with the digital medium, the CD, it would be read only, so you couldn't do anything with it. You could only buy and be a consumer, you couldn't create. And that was actually really good for evolution as well, because that meant that we have a digital, digitalization, which is like the foundation of how music is spread today. And the internet was growing at the same time. So in the 80s, it wasn't that big. But today, you know, in 90s and forwards, it's been just expanding all the time, as everybody knows. And with the decentralization with the internet and the 
everything being digital, you have a democratization, which means that everybody can decide for themselves what they're interested in culturally, politically, and everything. You don't have everything like served from a media uh, a company. And this was really, really good, but it becomes like a, like a rift between people. Because on the one side, you have the record companies and the movie industry that says, well, we just want to control everything so we can say what people should and shouldn't buy. We want to be able to control everything surrounding this. And on the other side, you have people saying, well, we want to, we want to pay for it, but we just want to participate. We want to be able to share music. We want to be able to you know, have it our way. And while the industry is talking about how much a song should cost on iTunes, should it be $1, 125 that's their big issue. At the same time, like, I have so much music, I don't, find, I don't have enough time to listen to it. That's my problem. It's not really, we're not living in the same world, so I want someone to help me find just the music I like. Uh, I would pay for the service, I wouldn't pay for the music maybe, but I would pay for the service. And I'm going to tell you a story, even I'm just going to drink some water. Just for you, Pau. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a really stupid story, but this is about humankind. So uh, probably a lot of people drink coffee and everything. Do you do like this when you drink coffee? Up with hands? Anyone? Up with the little fingers? Tea, coffee, whatever, when you drink. Come on, be honest. Okay, half of you almost. So, um, do you know why you do it? Probably not, because nobody cares about those, th those things besides me. Um, there was a guy that wanted to do some um, interesting information. You know, he wanted to find out some cultural aspects of why we do things. So he was really interested in that because he couldn't find like if it's to balance the cup or anything. It's like no, it's not for that. So he started researching, and he came back that, well, it started in the 16th century in, in uh, France. All of a sudden, people started doing it. And why did they do it? So he researched and researched and found out that all of the rich people were doing like this, and the peasants were copying the, their behavior because, well, if the rich people do it, it means it has to be good, so we have to do it as well. So it just like today when we do it, it's because our ancestors did it, and we just copied uh, their behavior which is how human people work. So there's no reason for it, really, besides that we've uh, subconsciously seen people doing it. And the reason why people started doing the rich people did it is because um, well, at that time, it was really OK to have orgies. You could have sex with anyone. You should have sex with anyone at that time when you're rich enough. Uh, but what happens is that you, people didn't protect themselves, of course. And then someone got syphilis, which is a really bad disease. and um, what happens with syphilis? Your little finger stiffens after a while. <laughs> so when people drink like this, it's actually because they got syphilis. Well, that's just stupid. <laughs> so how many people know this guy? Is Charles Darwin. OK, good. He was a crazy guy back at his time. He said that people come from apes and monkeys, and that we're evolving as human species by you know, doing something which we're prepared to do and blah, blah, blah. And it didn't just come from somewhere. And this is the same thing with the internet. It didn't just arrive. It's not a revolution. So everything we do, like we copy it and we modify it and we make it a bit better all the time. Like, you know, we take a picture and we want someone else wants to take the same picture, but they do it just a little bit better. That's evolution. That's kind of what he found out. Uh, and he had this thing that he said. It's things change when you want them to and also when you don't want them to. That's kind of the basis for evolution. And there's a big thing here, because with the internet, as it is a e evolution, it's not a revolution where you can find a person and just cut his head off and you're done with it. So file sharing is not, not something you can stop because it's part of evolution. So in order to make that something good, you need to adopt and listen to why this is an evolutionary thing. So my friends at the record companies, the ones I like with the bad name, the Swedish model, um, they give away all of their music for free. They wanted everybody just to download it and so they can sell things like this. So they went back in time and found this old music box. And they took like the hits from some of their artists and made them into music boxes they could buy. It's like $20 or something for one of these, which is more than they ever made on a CD. Because with a CD, you have to pay the distributors and everything. And they don't make any money from that. So 
give out something for free and then sell something really expensively to the fans, and you get more money than you did before by selling where no one profited from it. At the same time, you have you know, this evolution. The internet is becoming faster and faster, and we have this thing called the Moore's Law, which says that everything is going to be, like computers are going to be twice as fast, twice as powerful in 18 months. So the difference today between two hard drives, like they look the same, but in 18 months, they're going to be the same price, but twice the amount of, uh, of uh, data on them. So what that means, if you actually look a bit in the future, it means that every piece of data that's ever been created will be able to fit on a USB memory stick in 50 years, and you can copy it to someone in just a couple of seconds. So how much should a song be worth? That USB stick will be very expensive, so it wouldn't work. So we need to change the business model a bit. And at the same time, everybody's getting better internet connectivity. So today you expect when you're at the beach, you want to have uh, 100 megabits in your cell phone, and you want it to be everywhere in the world. Otherwise, you're going to be upset. That's the future. And you have to, for the music industry and the movie industry, they have to adopt to this reality. That's not going to stop. And that's a big problem for them. And one of the things I find the most interesting, if you look historically at what has happened in the media industry and the technology, is that you see a really rapid uh, evolutionary pace. And today on Facebook, you can sell stupid presents like this. I think they removed it because no one really, really did. But the idea was that like, you like someone, you can give them a dollar to give them a virtual gift. But it's always much nicer to have a physical gift, right? So rather give a real... Uh, uh, flower to your girlfriend than just like a picture of a flower. That's just crappy. So there are some people uh, working on a really interesting project that I love called the RepRap. So the RepRap is a 3D printer. It sounds a bit lame, but this printer is like 500 US dollars for the first copy. Uh, thing is, it can copy 70% of itself. You can print by this printer. So the idea is to make it self-replicating. So you can buy one and then make copies of it just by adding uh, small pieces of plastic. And today, it's just plastic. The next version will be some type of uh, concrete that you can print uh, like uh, stone or something like that. And then it's going to be metal. And it's going to be faster to print and print. What, and what does that really mean? If you look historically, what happened like 30 years ago, it was, you know, it was Star Trek to have a CD burner and to burn a CD, it's like really Star Trek. And a CD burner was 10,000 US dollars. And today, like, it's 100 times faster, and, and you don't even want it because someone just throws it after you. It's just crap. So if you look at historically, what will happen in the future? Like in 30 years, 3D printers will probably be able to print a pair of shoes. I don't wear any money. I, I should have some. Uh, <laughs> but that's a fact if you look at it. Technology is that, that rapid. And the same laws that apply today when it comes to us downloading a music track is the same law that's going to apply in the future that makes it possible for us to, instead of buying a pair of jeans from Vietnam or something, just print them locally by something you produce locally for half the price and no slave labor and all of that. And that's essentially what this happens. All of the copy fight, as we call it, is essentially about the big picture. And at the same time, the big picture for the music and music industry is how much is the song worth? So, thank you. So I think we have some times for question. Not? Yeah. So if anyone has any questions for me, Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dan. Uh, I really like the idea of the, pre of the of the 3D printer. It's like some of physical from Neumann machine, um, which can print it itself, self self replicating, um, and that's a very in interesting idea. Uh, how could could this be a form of, the, of artificial life in the future? Well, <laughs> that's a really hard question. Uh, but yeah, probably, you know, everything's possible. If you look at technology evolution, sure. But 
I think that's creepy though. I'm not really into artificial intelligence. Uh, problem is most people from certain countries have artificial intelligence. So it's not always good. Hello. Okay, so I would like to ask there. you another yes. question. Yes. It is related to the to the history if the the installation were were in Mexico yeah. as it started. Do you think that will be will, will create a change in in the production since it uh, starts in Mexico and it continue growing, and maybe this, the history of your company could be a little different. Do you think that could be could make a change for our country also? And the second question, uh, I will let, tell you l later. Okay, so uh, did I get it right that you wanted to know if Pirate Bay stayed here, or what will happen to Mexico if if it is, is stay here? Well, you would be on a U.S. trade sanction list, I think. You wouldn't, you know. But that wouldn't be a bad thing, I think, either, because I don't think people should buy too much stuff from the U.S. anyhow. That's just my personal opinion. And the second question is related to the water. Do you to think that to the water? Wa water? This one? Yes. Okay. And the music now is free. Yeah. But the water is costing more and more every time. What do you think that they should change for people to get more free water to the world? And if it, this could be possible. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. I've been working on a product in Sweden uh, that's called Kranen, which means the tap in Swedish. First, I wanted to take uh, Swedish tap water, which is really good, and put them in a bottle and export them to the US. And I wanted to sell them really expensively and then say, it's actually just tap water. <laughs> and they would probably buy it. Um, but it's, uh, I remade the, the idea into that I wanted to put tap water available all over the Sweden. So we have a project, we work on that. So we can have companies uh, supporting building a tap water system like you had in the old days where you could just go and fill your, your bottle with water. But it, it's a very big thing that water should definitely just be, um, you should take it locally and not buy it from the other side of the world. Uh, like Fiji water, which is an, a seriously bad example. Uh, the people in Fiji don't have their own water because they export all of it to the U.S. where it's really expensive and sold as something which is good for uh, humankind and good for the environment. Yeah. Perdona, si alguien tiene una pregunta en castellano y no la quiere hacer en inglés, como visteis con Wozniak, mi inglés no es todo lo bueno que podría ser, pero puedo ayudar, así que si queréis podéis preguntar en, en castellano. Um, so. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, uh, one of the presenters said uh, if your only requisite for coming here was you didn't want to land in the U.S., what would actually happen if you did? Well, yeah, so uh, I flew over the U.S., which was scary. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably allowed in the U.S., but I don't think I would have actually be allowed to leave, which is a big problem. And uh, I've already prepared if there's an emergency landing in the U.S. The ti I'm writing a book about the Pirate Bay in my uh, life with it, and I have... The title for it right now is uh, Lord of the Files, because I like the Lord of the Flies. Funny. And uh, if it ends up that I have to go to the US, it would be from Pirate Bay to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so hopefully not. Uh, yeah, I would probably just be sued forever and ever and not being able to leave. There's a question okay. here. Or somewhere else. Here. Here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. You have said that many people have tried to block the Pirate Bay. And now we have the issue of net neutrality. What do you think about it? Do you think it can, be, it can become successful blocking sites like yours? Or no, I, I think if you start blocking websites, uh, people are just going to find ways around them. And it's like a cat with a rat. You know, If you force the rat into a corner, it's going to be aggressive. And that's kind of what's happening on the internet today. The people become really upset that they're being censored and they don't want that. So in the end, it's going to be not evolution, it's going to be a revolution against uh, the companies that try to enforce that and the governments. So I think in either we decide now that we have to have freedom of speech, we have to have uh, no censorship on the internet, and there's no reason for having censorship on the internet because if there is something illegally going on, you should go after that person and after that site or server and find it instead of censoring it. So. Uh, we have a lot of discussions in Sweden about something which is really disgusting, which is child porn. And it turns out that we have a filter in Sweden against child porn. 
which is quite bad, actually, because it just filters child porn so you can't see it. But that it doesn't remove the child porn, which should be the first tactic. So if you find something bad on the internet, remove it instead of censoring it. Because th that's the thing happening. And it turned out when someone leaked uh, the list that was actually on the child porn filter to WikiLeaks, uh, it was only like uh, anti-pornographic stuff. It was uh, just gay porn, which was not child porn. So it was for moral reasons they put stuff in there. So censorship will always be abused, and there will always be someone in control over it, which is not for the people. Este, what? Okay. okay. Mira, mi pregunta es que cuando se llegue al punto, o sea, de lo, de lo que él habla es algo muy padre, que todos dominen la información. Pero cuando llega ese punto, o sea, ¿qué piensa él que sería como el siguiente paso para las personas? O sea, ¿qué van a hacer para seguir con sus vidas o seguir trabajando? No sé, porque obviamente dominar información provoca más empleos. O sea, ¿sería una utopía así como el socialismo o qué? Ok, ¿qué piensas que están haciendo? Well, so, okay, so if I got the question right. So what happens with piracy when it comes to the, uh, the financial side of it is that the more people download, the more they spend on media. That's statistically proven in lots of research. So um, usually in Sweden, like five years ago, average spending would be like 200 US dollars per year for a person. And now it's up to 350 US dollars per year. And it's always, you see the significant change when people get access to more media they pay more for but in other uh, other directions so instead of paying for a cd today people pay by going to a concert or by buying merchandise or something like that so music uh, like revenue is not lost revenue is shifting place and that's because there's other business models uh, so when the music industry say that they're losing money it's not that they're actually losing money they're losing turnover so they're selling less but their profit is actually going up so there's not, I think there's only one company in, in the world, one of the big four companies, that didn't make a bigger profit each year the past 10 years. So they just want more. That's the problem. Okay, so someone has the microphone. Hi, I, I really want to thank you. It's thank you. <laughs> uh, the question is about, what do you think about Megalot and RapidShare? Do you think it's, it's fine, it's legal when it causes money, or what happened? And what do you think is the best evolution of the torrent? What happened to the torrent in the next years? So I didn't get the first question about rapid share. Was uh, what do you think about it? Uh, what do you think about rapid share, megablot, this sharing enterprise worldwide? Well, I, I think every type of sharing is good. Uh, it's the essence of people. So it couldn't be bad that people share information. Um, and uh, I, I think, yeah. RapidShare did a really big lawsuit, or they've been sued in Germany and they won, which says that they're not responsible for information that other people put on their website, which is really clever. Uh, and then, second question about torrents. I don't think that torrents is the future, or so to speak. It's just, there's not gonna be one single solution. Like, we have torrents today, but there's also different solutions for people. So it's all depending on what you feel like. Uh, and the internet has so many models for everything. So you can't have one single model for distribution. You can't have one single model for anything. And that also goes for how you make your money. You have to have different models for everything. So. Hi. Um, I'm currently studying in Canada. And being there, I saw that they have a pirate party. Yes. So I wanted to know, well, first two questions. That if the pirate parties in other countries are the same or associated to the pirate party over there, or uh, they're different. And my second question is, which is the country that is most friendly towards file sharing and piracy and sharing information? Well, um, first of all, I'm not a member of the Pirate Party, just to clarify that. I'm, I care too much about other things as well. Um, so I'm helping the Green parties all over Europe right now. Um, and then, uh, the, well, in Canada, it's, it's a quite small party still, I, I understand. But the good thing with the pirate parties are they are the same all over the world. So I think they're in 35 countries. And in Germany, they're like 2% of the voters. And, so, and that's like 2 million people or something. So it, it's really big and it's still growing. And I think they're a really big political force that makes other parties uh, have to change their politics. 
that, so that's kind of the, why I like them as, as a party. Uh, and second question, most friendly towards file shares. I don't know. It uh, could be Brazil. Uh, and uh, could also be some of the Swedish or Scandinavian countries. Uh, it's Swedish people love Pirate Bay. Swedish people love to share. Uh, but officially, the Swedish government is really afraid of letting that happen internationally because it's such a small nation. Uh, it's still legal in um, Holland to download music, uh, films. And there's a lot of s nations like that in Europe. So, I'm, But I think it's, it's, the biggest one would probably be Brazil. Um, first of all, uh, here in Mexico, the tacos eat with your finger. Okay. Um, second, uh, what's the future of the group of Peter Sunday and the Bread Bay? Sorry? What about the future of the group and the Peter Sunday as alternative uh, thinker and Bread Bay? Well, the future of Pirate Bay is that Pirate Bay should die, really. Uh, it's kind of this thing. It, nobody works really on the Pirate Bay. It's just there and it works all the time. Uh, and it's still growing. Like, if you see the site, nothing has happened in five years. And it's still more and more users using it, which is bad. We need some form of new technology so people won't relax as much if something happens. Uh, so that's kind of the future for the Pirate Bay, hopefully dying uh, and being replaced with something better, of course, because Pirate Bay really sucks. And uh, well, my future, I'm working full time with a company I founded called Flatter, which is a micropayment solution trying to make people share money as we share information. So uh, I'll have a talk tomorrow about it. It's a crazy idea. I wanted to remove the price tag of information and just say, like, pay amount one time each month that you decide yourself and then share that money between people that created some something you like. And that's what I'm working on. And then I'm going around talking. So I, I think that's the short-sighted future, at least. Eh, un, un tema pequeño. Nos dicen que solo tenemos tiempo para tres preguntas más. Eh, lo que yo haría es, como veo muchas manos, eh, como no me está entendiendo ahora y no tiene traducción, que es que baje y lo retenemos aquí hasta que os responda a todos uno por uno, ¿vale? Ahora después se lo comento a él, pero estoy seguro que, que, que va a estar encantadísimo. So what did you just say? The thing is, with Pau, he wants to make me upset, so I'll spank him. That's the thing. Hey. Yeah. What? It's his fetish. It's, yeah, it's his fetish. He has lots of them. <laughs> okay, so any more questions, or is this yeah, over? Yeah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I have a question for you. There you are. All right. Um, everybody agrees that a uh, different business model for music works very well, and you can add value selling I don't know, uh, extra merchandise, and you can give the music away from free. Um, but when I, when I hear that, I, 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 I agree 100%. But what about the movie industry, for instance? I, I bet you have talked to way more people than I ever did. So maybe you have heard some um, ideas of an alternate business model for the Hollywood. Yeah, side. so uh, what business model are we talking about today? Because this is the thing. Most people think that Hollywood sell movies. They don't. They sell dreams. That's their slogan. Uh, and they want people to come and, and buy tickets for the movies, but they're lowering the numbers, uh, how much it costs to go to uh, the cinema. And why is that? Because they don't want to share that money with uh, the people who create the movie, because they always have this sharing deal that, you know, if the movie is great, making a lot of money, we share with the actors and all of that. Instead, what they do is that in, U in the US, Uh, the Hollywood companies get a portion of all of the sales surrounding the movies. So uh, popcorn, the, you know, you sell popcorn for two dollars, and the movie company gets one and a half, and they don't have to share that money with artists. Uh, that's basically what they do. And also, the, even though they make a lot of money on the sales of tickets and on DVDs, the most amount of money they they actually make is from merchandise surrounding it. So if you see Shrek the money they make is actually from small toys and so on. And also, you know, they're still making a bigger profit each year because movies for me is not about the movie itself. When I go to the cinema, which I actually still do, it's because I want to go there with my girlfriend or with my friends and do something social. So it's not always about... That's, the movie's more an excuse to do something like that. And that's the way it's always been. So they don't really need to change their business model. They just need to make better movies. Um, 
because they're not making really good movies right now. Uh, well, hay un problema, yo soy un mandado, como veis, me mandan, se ve que, dado que responde tan lentamente, no podemos hacer más preguntas. He visto que está haciendo una cola para que firme autógrafos, ahora se lo comentaré. Así que os invitaría a dos cosas, quien quiera un autógrafo que haga la cola, quien tenga preguntas, mañana da otra conferencia eh, y probablemente conseguiremos un poco más de tiempo después para hacer todas las preguntas. Entonces, you see that queue there? It's, it's because they want you to sign the autograph. Oh, Wozniak no. oh. got a Kiwi until the camping, so it's, it's not that many people. This is your seat? Yeah. Oh. This is your Whoa. seat to sign? I uh. feel stupid now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, oh. lo, lo siento por el tema de las preguntas. Creo que habéis oído antes que la gente ha gritado mucho. Creo que podemos dar el mejor aplauso del mundo okay, y gritar so mucho más para que I'm se quede I'm just going to say one thing. I, I write like a doctor, so you can't read anything I, I, I write. Okay. So. Un fuerte aplauso para él. Thank you. I told them you will be answering all the questions they have for hours and hours and hours, okay? Oh, okay. okay.